sector company. Uh, you've all heard of it, but I'm not allowed to say what it is. Uh, he's got multiple master's degrees, years of experience doing this, so we're fortunate to have him. I want to say thanks to Brennan for being here today. I want to say thanks to our sponsors, and we'll leave you the floor. Thank you. Uh, so thanks everybody for coming out. Uh, I hope to make this entertaining. Most of you are lucky and bored already. Come on. Or who had the turkey at lunch? Is that what it is? Are you feeling sleepy? Did you have a couple beers too? Yeah. All right. So I'm going to kind of talk to you about Threadmark. A little bit about me. Uh, I have been known to be a network security guy. I have been doing this since 1997. So at least 10 years. I'm not great at math. But uh, I'm also an adjunct professor. So I'm going to talk to you guys about adding threat modeling into your reviews. All right. How many of you have threat modeled before? All right. What are you incorporated in? Are you guys developers? Was. Was? <laughs> Developing? All right. System what else can you threat model? All right. System work. Huh? Architect boundary system. All right. Network system. Networks? Yeah, that's where I started with networks. All right. So, what I like to say is, have you ever taken a hard look at yourself? Think about it. This is exactly what threat modeling is. You're going to take that introspective look at whatever you're objectifying to threat model. All right. This is. We're going to say, I'm going to be critical, and I'm going to see what, you know, what doesn't need to be seen, all right, what should not be out there, okay? It's a structured approach where we identify and priority and create prioritization of security threats out there, okay? What does that mean? So we're going to just sit there and identify what could go wrong. What's our worst case scenario? Where is something going to go boom in the middle of the night? And I'm thankful I don't have to do on call anymore because there's no such thing as an architecture emergency. <laughs> but a lot of you, I've had to do on call for decades. So I know what it is. But this allows us to take those proactive measures that we use for you know, assessing our own system security. Okay, We're going to take a hard look at that. And we're going to identify those vulnerabilities. So earlier you may have been at Philip Wiley's or some of these others where we're talking about threat hunting and all that. Well, we're going to take a look at how those might be able to be exploited and what compensating controls and what mitigations we can apply to that to make these, you know, have a less of a risk exposure out there. What can we do to reduce our exposure? Okay. So I don't represent any vendor, so I'm not going to give you anything like that. We're just going to go over on um, what it takes to do this. So what's the first thing we have to do when we do an assessment? Or we do this. We have to identify all of our assets. You know, what do we have? Okay. What is out there? How many of you knew everything, all the devices in your own house? All right? You have a list of everything. How many of you, like recently, they're talking about advice about all the storms that came through and all the insurance, people got hit by tornadoes. And they're like, what have I had? Because you know what? You can threat model anything. Anything can really be threat modeled. I even remember this case study of somebody threat modeling a courtesy pool bar at b sites or Black Hat one year at a pool bar. You know, so how many of you understand, like, have pictures of all of your stuff in your house in case you need to make an insurance plan? One person, two people, three people. All right, you have all the serial numbers, all that kind of stuff. Very good. You're better than me. <laughs> I know I need to do this crap. I just moved here. Okay. And the movers have all of my stuff right now. And so I documented everything before I get into the building. <laughs> so that's the only. I just have a body on my wife. 
to do Night Wives. I'm just OCD. Tomorrow. You're OCD. Okay. <laughs> All right. So we got that going for us. But if we're looking at our businesses, our systems and networks, there's so many times when I've been around a business or company, I used to work for a different financial organization that does a lot of transactions that we all use. Uh, and uh, it's a managed service kind of provider for a lot of financial institutions. Uh, it was surprising, you know, one day I got a call and said, hey, could you go look at this Juniper box? I'm like, where's it at? I don't have a list of inventory. Oh, well, it's at this data center. Like, okay, I I'm showing that data center is big, big commission. Uh, on paper it has, but we're still using it. I'm like, yikes. So systems, networks, we need to understand, have a good inventory of that. We need to have the applications and services that are running on these things. The data, how many of you consider data an asset? Exactly. Thank you. A lot of people who are starting out don't really understand it. They think you're protecting the, you know, the network, the servers. The only thing of value out there is really your data. All the rest of that can be replaced. But your data, that's what we're all here to protect. All right. Uh, personnel and users. Do you have a list of all your current assets? You know, the assets, we, you know, unless you're a CIO, you don't call them an asset. Uh, your people, where they're at, where contact, good directory of people, infrastructure facilities, your building locations, your, their addresses available in case if something happens. These are all things you need to understand. So our basics are, we need to identify those assets. That's why I started out by stressing that. Uh, the next step is you determine your potential threats. What is my exposure? What can happen when I am exposed? All right. Uh, then comes the risk kind of stuff. You evaluate the likelihood of it happening. You have all those risk management numbers that we can go through and the impact of it. So it's usually these matrices. There's different ways to determine risk. We're not going to get into that. And then the one I like is the prioritizing of threats. You know, which one's the most important to which one is least likely to happen, you know, like was it uh, the, in 2029, there's supposed to be an asteroid that comes within 18,000 miles of Earth, and it could hit us, at, and if it comes through a certain window, according to Neil deGrasse Tyson, that uh, it could then hit us on the next rotation around. It would definitely hit us, and you know, in 2036, well, you know, what's the likelihood of that really happening? It's a one in 300 million shot of it hitting that one precise point in orbit to where it's going to alter its orbit to hit us, you know. So, likelihood of that happening, I'm not going to lose any sleep over that. All right. And then the last part is the fun part where we develop those uh, mitigations, those compensating controls. All right, so what we have is an attack vector out there. Uh, this is the path or method, you know, as you've all heard most of these pen testing guys talk about that use, they're going to use to attack us, all right? The, you know, phishing, malware, network-based attacks. Those guys talking about how they use, you know, Nessus or Qualos or something to check us out, or even Nmap for these things. They have all those things. Our attack surface is the total vulnerabilities in the system. Your system could be anything from a targeted point, okay? Like I like to do is I get everyone who's doing this for their permit to operate, we have to do their applications and stuff, and we have to look at that as that system, we threat model it that way, and we kind of get them to have that perspective, which is great to give them perspective on how to shift left, which is, you know, that old marketing term we all hear now and then, right? You know, the vendor's calling you, we're gonna help you shift left. Yeah, right. All right. So we're going to help identify that for the weak spots for the attacker. Now, you have the attack tree, which is the graphic representation of the attacker pass. And then they can have those different models and scenarios that prioritize mitigations based on that. You can set up those little funny tree little graphs and models that, you're, uh, that you can present up to your CISO 
he can present that to the board, in a civil executive summary. Those are all the fun little reports that I end up having to help with. Uh, then you talk about the attack life cycle. You know, we've already talked about that. Uh, the stages, reconnaissance, exploitation, and post-exploitation in a nutshell. You were in Philip Wiley's one, right? You saw that. So you saw some of y'all were there. He talked about that. I don't need to rehash all that. Uh, and then we talk about those who developed those targeted, you know, mitigations. So what can we do specifically out there? That's where your dev guys come in. How are they going to fix it? All right. You're going to risk it and fix it fix it, right? Risk it and fix it. So that's how we get through that. Now, when you're doing threat modeling, three philosophies you can take. The first one is the defender, okay? These are stride, defense, beat, desist, and the minor defend. So how many of you got on Miner's website? Heard of Miner yet? Yeah. Miner's got a great thing out there called Miner Defend. Has a great matrix out there. We have the stride model, we have the desist model, and then from an attacker perspective, how would I attack this in the mindset? Like I like to describe this the mindset of a pen tester or a evildoer who's trying to get in your stuff. Okay? And then we have the risk-based fact, which is, you know, the counters who want to do this stuff. The bean counters. All right. And that, that one's known as PASTA for some reason, okay? It's the process for attack simulation and threat analysis. All right, so let's break down a couple of these. Hey, get over there. All right, so stride, spoofing, tampering, repudiation, information, disclosure, denial of service, and elevation of privilege. That sounds just like pretty much all encompassing of what could go wrong. All right, we know spoofing is somebody pretending to be somebody else, right? I can be somebody pretending to be, I can say I'm Philip Boyle, but how many of you all would know the difference? Right? So, I'm not Philip, Philip will kill me on the slide back. Um, so, I, somebody, somebody's pretending to be somebody else. Tampering. Uh, this is what we all figure. Somebody is out there trying to change our stuff around and mess with our configurations, you know, and open it up, install those rats and back doors and all that kind of stuff. So something bad can come in. The next one's repudiation. How many of y'all know what repudiation means? That's always one. All right, so a couple of us do. So it means that you know we're out there trying to, uh, there's no deniability. There's no plausible you know, deniability. It's you, we know it's you, we gotcha. All right, it's definitely there. Uh, information disclosure, well that's the worst one. Where you know the stuff gets out, all right. Your information's out. It's bad. Denial of service means you know you lose that you know availability, which is one of the three triads of the CIA triad, right? You don't want to lose that availability. And elevation of privilege, well, that's game over. So that means they have got root. Now, desist is pretty much the same thing except they add that dispute part of it, all right, in there. So we have the same thing to strive, but the dispute is the concept of, you know, it's not really who, you, who it is, and it causes that fuzz out there. So it was a thing by my old boss, Gunnar Peterson. Uh, he helped develop this when he was at Carnegie Mellon. And uh, so they developed this, it, if you want to read about it, uh, they have it in this one, but it's the lesser used of any of the threat modeling parts other than pasta. Click. All right. Now, MITRE DEFEND is a great tool. So if you ever get a chance to go out there and you create your frame model framework, you can use a lot of these components out there for MITRE. So it's harden, detect, isolate, deceive, evict, and restore. And they break down all of their threats in this long matrix. If you want to do mobile, you can click on the mobile column. Uh, if you want to do uh, containers, or even the, they even come up uh, with some different ones for the IoT stuff now. So we have that one out there. And so MITRE CAPEC and MITRE ATT&CK are my two favorite ones. 
And that's if you're ever trying to do some kind of a rapid threat assessment or any kind of where you're focusing and looking to show an attacker perspective, these show the attack vectors out there. And you could, I like to say, I would use my KPEC as the front end to help, you know, show what the attack vectors are and how they can be mitigated and kind of incorporate MITRE Defend in my threat model when I'm looking at different things. So for you doing your systems, these are great resources for you to learn and utilize. Now MITRE Attack is also very good. It's a very in-depth knowledge base out there. So it helps you like adversarial te techniques. Um, I think they came up with, what, didn't they just come up with Atlas on this one too? How many of you heard of the Atlas where it helps show you how to attack AIs? All right, so uh, I think it's called Atlas? Yeah, so they just were announcing that at RSA last month. So they talked about how that's gonna come up where it's gonna incorporate AI into your attack vectors for the minor attack. All right, now the Delphi technique. How many of you ever heard of this when you were in school? You know, let's all gather around the conference table, order some pizzas. We did this at Microsoft a lot. So we would sit around and we're like, this would be like our bug bash or something. How can we do this? How can we break this? How can we uh, attack this in security? And we would sit around and we would start with the dumbest ideas, like throw a hammer at it to, you know, right up to something like, well, let's see if it's SQL injection would work, you know? And we would talk about different things, and it's where you share ideas and perspectives. Now, it's really important now when you're doing more group thing, you want to incorporate more users in there, but you want to incorporate, you know, different perspectives uh, from, you know, I would say big management in there, upper management, who has perspective from the board, you know, if you're in a corporation. You can look at getting HR, uh, a couple of users, and just get a little sample of different people in your company to get that. You know, big variance perspectives to see what they can do. You'll get somebody here who's like, I have no idea what I'm doing here. But it's kind of funny, after a while, that perspective, they start listening, they add something. And then you're like, everybody in the room is like engineer mindset. It was like, where did that come from? And that's an excellent thing. Nobody thought about doing something like that. We've had so many of these ideas where that has come through. I recommend, you know, have that diversity out there of those perspectives from different areas within your company. All right. And then again, you're sitting there, okay, which one's more important to you? Like if the unit managers of the applicant or the products, they might be saying, well, we can't afford to have this down. We were thinking, yeah, we can patch it and reboot it once a day or something if necessary. Or no, they, they can say we have we can't have zero downtime because of the business loss. You get all these kind of things going out there with that. And here comes finally we're going to talk about a little bit of pasta. And this is the process for attack simulations and threat analysis. Again, it's risk based and it's a framework, and it's kind of more uh, at a strategic level rather than a technical level. This is where they are sitting there discussing more about what is our reputational risk if something happens? How do you remember the target reach? All right? All right, what happened with target right after that? Nobody wanted to use cards in target anymore. All right, reputation. Everybody did anyone to target after that? They were paying cash. Home Depot was like that too. Everybody wanted to pay cash. All right. Now that was reputational risk. How many of you can see reputational risk in a breach or in a threat? Okay. Well, I'm not teaching y'all anything now. <laughs> but there are some out there, yeah. So you have to consider that reputational. What about uh, what other risks do you consider? I want to hear different perspectives. This is a group, I like Socratic learning. On the topic of reputational events, you can speak to you and go with your box as well. Okay. What else? What else can y'all think of? We get from a legal risk perspective. Legal? That's it. Strategic risk, financial risk, operational risk, those are all very risk 
you, you also looked at regulatory risk. Regulatory? Oh, yeah, I was about to say that. I took me health care. You know, um, mobility is exploited. Okay. Yeah. There's a lot of consequences that are very long term. Okay. And regulatory. How many of you consider regulators a threat? I'm in FINRA, baby. NYDFS. If I have somebody come in and say, my five largest financial institution can no longer operate in the state of New York, that includes the New York Stock Exchange. Uh oh. So, yeah, these are things we have to take into all that consideration. Okay? So, we got to use that framework to consider all these different risks of where it could be. So it sounds like you guys are starting to use pasta. Have you actually adopted pasta? Not knowingly, right? But now you're thinking, yeah, we should read up on it and actually use some of their techniques, which would be good to do. It's a great new perspective. I want you to be out there and be open to new perspectives. All right? So common mistakes when you're doing threat modeling. Uh, Philip Wiley gave a perfect example earlier. Well, that's not in scope. How many of you heard that term? That's not in scope. All right. Uh, what's the healthcare agency that just got uh, hit? Ascension. Huh? Ascension. Ascension. Is that the one that they change. left your Citrix server? Change. Maybe not change healthcare. Maybe. I don't remember. One of the guys who I work with, was one of my students works there, and he was working it. And he was telling me that they, uh, what, when they said their Citrix system that they use to help manage everything, uh, that was considered to be out of scope for everything. And that was the only thing that did not you have to use multi-factor authentication. And guess what? It got popped. And they, they went through everything and took, took them out. All right. Uh, so. That's that out of scope thing. So ignoring those assets is bad. All right. Uh, not considering the tech service. Uh, I worked for Microsoft for a long time. Uh, when Bing got attacked, I called some of my friends, my old colleagues. Uh, when Lapsus attacked them, what happened was that they paid a contractor who was like, you know, let go in two weeks. Contract was up. They gave the guy ten thousand dollars and he's like, "Hey, we can't get a piece of Microsoft Teams your credentials on your multi-factor. Just say yes." Boom, and they were in there and they grabbed check code of Bing. Okay, they were able to connect in, go to the repository, grab the debug test code, and download all of that to use it for their analysis. Is that fun or not? I mean. That's a threat that nobody considered would happen. Oh, well, he signed his NDA. You know, <laughs> these are things that are threats. So that's an attack surface, right? People, insider threat. Well, I have people have been preaching that since I've been going to these conferences. So I'm gonna get off that horse. Uh, failing to prioritize those threats. How many of you had some manager going, no, 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 that's too hard to do right now. We're gonna look at something else. All right, we want you to go with the low-hanging fruit, and that way we can show that we've made a lot of process. We've made our patches, but you know these things that don't even have a firewall in front of them that are exposed directly on the internet that are legacy, we can ignore those. Nothing's happened to them yet. You know, th those are the things out there. The human factors, we're overlooking that, we already mentioned that. And then focusing too much on those technical solutions. How many of you have those people who think you can just buy a technical solution? We'll put another firewall in front of us. Right. Uh, we've got a proxy server. All right, we're using uh, CrowdStrike out there, or was not Cloudflare, or we have a CDN. Uh, you know, these are the things out there. Uh, we have uh, we're using Fortinet, we're using Checkpoint, we're using Palo Alto. This should be good. Uh, are all your rule sets just uh, from anywhere to this, you know, on port 80 and 443 all open still? Yeah. Do you have any of the application layer stuff? No. All right, so stop focusing on the technical solution. Let's actually look at, you know, 
what we can do to get those fixed out there. And it's an art to ask the correct questions. Is it not? Have you ever had those people who are, it's like, well, I guess it's not with chat GPT. If you can ask it the right way, like you saw in the last presentation, it's how you ask the question. It's an art. So it's like when you ever talk to a regulator, you know, what's, you, you talk to regulators like it's just like, yes, no, or you go to court. How many of you ever got pulled over by a cop for speeding? I have. You don't want to say too much, right? Where are you going? That way. Where are you coming from? That way. You being a smart ass? No, sir. I'm just answering your exact questions. You know? That works. Don't answer too many questions. Make sure it's your vehicle. No, sir. Yeah, so always ask the right kind of questions. It's an art. All right. That helps in determining what assets they have. I mean, oh, yeah, we have a virtualization server. Yeah, it's running ESX. We have uh, the emotion there, yeah. Okay. Uh, we have this other internal clouds. Okay, great. We have that. What's running in them? You know, they're not going to tell you this unless you ask them. So you have to run those ask questions. Then you have to ask what are actually the potential threats, like the, all these are different things you're going to want to ask and get that in that framework. All right. Then you got the threat mitigation catalogs. You know, NIST 853 has a great list of different threats and out there. ISO 27001, 2002. Uh, ENSA, have y'all looked at the ENSA one from Europe? All right, so if any of you are doing business in Europe, but even if you're not, it's a great comprehensive list of stuff to utilize for just to gather learning and get those threats out there. And my slides are on the, uh, on the website for these. Sorry, I don't make them too fancy with all the graphs. I apologize. I just want to get a focus on the talk and not the information. Uh, NIST 800-154, Guidelines for Threat Modeling, has a great deal of information out there for that. And uh, we have the different threat modeling mitigations. You know, these are access control, authentication, and authorization. I don't know what the difference is, I hope. All right, it's like, who am I and where am I allowed to go? A lot of people just kind of goes over that. Uh, data encryption is your confidentiality of your CID triad. Uh, your firewalls, network security, intrusion detection, intrusion response, good IR, you know, policy and procedures that everyone has access to. All right, security awareness training that everybody just clicks to as fast as they can. How many of y'all done that? <laughs> I do that all the time. <laughs> I see how fast I can get through them. This will take you an hour. Got it done in six minutes. All right, uh, incident response planning. All right, uh, what happens when the bike hits the fan, you know? All right, and then we have our, make sure we do our regular updates, patching, please patch everything. All right, uh, your vulnerability assessment, penetration testing. Well, those are all those fancy guys who give you those deep talks about how they can do all those deep analyzations and stuff. And then the golden rule, back up. Backup, backup, and have it test your backup in case you ever have a disaster. All right, I'm going to open up to QA. We're going to make this quick, fun, and I think I should, we should go get beer after this. <laughs> <laughs> is the beer all gone? Yes. It is? I got the last one, but it's a son of a. That's the important question. What category is Three. <laughs> All right. Uh, oh, I forgot the joke I promised Jared I would say. All right, uh, cow jokes. Still like cow jokes? All right. Uh, what did the rancher, why was the rancher not upset when he went bankrupt? He had no beef. <laughs> Y'all ready for a risk one? All right. Yes. What did the elephant say to the naked man? I didn't breathe through that thing. Oh. <laughs> All right, any questions? 
Well, he actually doesn't do that thing. <laughs> So working with clients as a third party okay. consultant, that's the context. Uh, how do you deal with using, um, just using threat modeling as your, your weapon, your, your way of proving to them? How do you convince them to spend an investment to protect themselves when they are being obstinate? What is your strategy? So it's a third party partner you're saying. Okay. Well, you don't want to say it's a weapon. That's what we're saying. You want to use it as collaboration. All right. We need collaborative management our mutual interests are met. That's how I would approach it with any of our third party partners. So we ask them to do this. Uh, mainly, it has to be written in any contractual obligations. So there has to be that word in the contract for them, if for them to be compliant. If not, they would be a breach. They could be a potential breach of client. I'm not. An attorney representing you. I'm not doing any legal advice here, but I'm saying there's a potential for a breach of contract if they do not want to. Uh, now, if you have a lot of agencies, there's legal regulations out there that provide for the necessity to occur, which is like NYDFS 500, PCI, uh, I believe the GLBH for FINRA regulations has a lot of that stuff. Uh, I'm more financially focused. Um, what's the one for energy? NERC. Uh, NERC. Yeah, NERC has a lot of those things. Uh, especially if you're doing many uses for the military town here. A lot of the military third party products have those things in their DOD defense contracts. So it depends on, like, you know, if they're going to make them perform some kind of a state in there. So it all comes down to a compliance regulation for that. And we have to convince them it's in their best interest, or else you may have to terminate that uh, relationship with them. But you want to say, look, we want to be protected, we want you to be protected. You can point out the target breach as an example and say, look, Target had their stuff cut. Their contractor, who was controlling all their AC and back connections into all of their things, they were not. That's how they got in and they were able to penetrate target. You do not want to be the one responsible for that. We want to help you and we want to collaborate with you and share best practices on how you can protect yourself. So you want to offer up as that investment. That's how I usually go to there. We have a lot of our colleagues going to reinforce for meeting with AWS executives to help them understand how certain parts of their cryptographic uh, mechanisms for security in the US are actually insecure that we use. So, yeah. Well, and they're improperly protecting private keys in certain situations. Key management, sorry. Mm -hmm. Key management is a big vulnerability for a lot of things, especially when if you can dump a container or something out there that and where you can extract a private key from. Instead of utilizing uh, an HR sound or something like that for that purpose. Well, we're technical. I'm not a manager, I promise. <laughs> I'm actually a long time geek, but okay. Uh, any other questions? Um, yeah. What about the future proofing? Um, so, for instance, if you think there's a good possibility that you're Maybe your business in Europe that doesn't currently is it worthwhile to go ahead and try and implement those? All right, so as you know, does your company do business in California? Yes. All right, so you have the CPCA for stuff like that. All right, so you have GDPR Lite already. Maybe the framework for GDPR Lite, they call CPCA out. So, as a framework for that, it's always a good practice to adopt. Now, the Europe regulations have the new one out there called DORA, okay? So DORA is coming out. If you look at my blog, I wrote a paper about this a couple of years ago, which breaks down how to find it. So I don't know if you have my blog. Just Google me. You might find it. You might not. Nobody ever reads it. I think I had 15 hits on it. Uh, now companies are trying to sell the same information. But I wrote that for law school, and I just went ahead and published it out there. Uh, so. Yeah, if you want a future proof and you want to use that DORA infrastructure, uh, that framework is very extensible and it would apply. 
to the United States. The one thing about Europe is you may not be doing business in Europe, the Europeans may be doing business with you. And which then would make you, in the eyes of the European court, uh, under their domain, I would say. Loosely stated, they feel that they might come after you for them. You know? So it's like when you're dealing with different court systems, you know, you're based in Texas, they're based in Kentucky. Uh, they file a motion against you in, say, a court in California. Yeah. Wait, where's that relationship? They can put it in any jurisdiction or federal history. Same with the idiot. They can take it to court of international trade. You know, just because it's a European citizen who's lived, residing in the United States, they feel that they may have that domain over it. So it's always good to be aware of all those type of legal representations legal aspects in that case. But that's not legal advice. <laughs> that's just you know, general you know, awareness of the law. Anybody else? Yeah. Where do you block? It's not a block spot. It's something I started years ago. But the Google search is not It's not Brennan. Well, I found you. Well, find my LinkedIn. I haven't been on LinkedIn for a while. You can add me on LinkedIn. I'm sorry, I don't give a lot of social media. I'm not a guy who does a lot of publishing stuff. Uh, you know, it's my first time doing a presentation since 2004. So, but I do teach cyber crime and cyber terrorism at Collin College in Frisco, Texas, north of Dallas. And there were security and firewalls there too. And in the fall, we teach them privacy. So. All right. Anything else? All right, good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're done. Well, at least I hope it was somewhat entertaining. <laughs> I wouldn't have guessed 20 years ago. <laughs> I'm old. No, I meant that you've had for 20 years. I've been doing this for 20 years. Oh, okay, well. Just like you were saying you didn't have practice, and I said, good job. Okay, thanks. Not anything to do with your age.